Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Breastfeeding 101. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know me, probably, Dr. Andrew, and you are in for a treat because Emily here is expert in all things breastfeeding. Before we even talk anything about that, just a little heads up about what's going down today. You can't see, but, and I won't move the computer because, you know, everything's <laughs> situated perfectly right now. But we've got her amazing little twins running around. So we're probably going to be laughing and like giggling out off to the side because they're going to be just being little twins they're 20 months 20 months they're 20 months yeah zeke our son is just a month older than them and we know how crazy he is and that's just one of them so yes. this is going to be laid back this is going to be casual um but that's what being a mom is like yes having craziness all around it wouldn't be you probably wouldn't know what to do if this was like calm and peaceful no no yeah. it would it's just never be weird. Calm and peaceful. no <laughs> it wouldn't be real um so anyways welcome guys <laughs> feel free to ask questions feel free to chime in let us know what you're um, hoping to get out of our, our time here this morning I don't know exactly how long it's gonna last because that depends on what you want to get from it uh, like we were talking about just a couple minutes ago we could probably go for hours and hours and hours on the, the brainstorming that we were going through for this uh, morning's chat we won't do that but we promise it will be valuable and full of really practical information uh, so like I mentioned we are really uh, blessed to have Emily joining us because she kind of has the expertise and the experience that you want from a breastfeeding expert. She is a labor and delivery nurse for how long? Um, a little over three years now. A little over three years as yeah. a labor and delivery nurse, which you've been working with moms on that early breastfeeding relationship there. Yes. Just recently completed her lactation consultant IBCLC certification, Correct. which is not a small like weekend course yeah. that's a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of uh, a lot of hours going yeah. to getting that certification um so lactation consultant labor and delivery nurse huge baby wearing advocate and she walked oh, in here yes. strapped on the twins front and back um la leche league leader if you're familiar with la leche league at all For huge five years. five years of doing that so that's yes. supporting moms and just a peer-to-peer -peer, um hangout relationship uh, very casual setting. I'm sure, we'll talk a little bit about Lelecha here. Mm -hmm. um, and the most important thing is just the real life experience of having gone through this with three kiddos, the two boys and older daughter who just got sent off to first grade today. Woo! So uh, <laughs> that's why I'm, I've been talking about this stuff and I've been so excited because we get to learn from all that experience and expertise. So thank yes. you for hanging out with us. No problem. Um, and so one thing I wanted to ask from the get-go, because I honestly don't even know the question is, is what got you into breastfeeding? Where did your breastfeeding journey start? Just when you were a new mom, you knew that something you wanted to do or right. how did that come about? So with Peyton, which is my older daughter, she's now six. I knew I wanted to breastfeed her when I was pregnant. So I attended my first school HA league meeting. When I was probably about eight months pregnant. And that was actually the first time I ever saw anybody nurse their baby. Um, and I was just amazed at these women and what they were going through and, and just their challenges that they were speaking of. And, and I said, you know what, I'm going to nurse my baby and I could do it. And we nursed and I loved it and we didn't really have any issues. I was kind of the minority in that, which I was very lucky in that case. And when she turned about nine months, I said, I want to become a leader. Hmm. And usually you have to breastfeed your baby for a year to become a relationship leader. So I started the coursework for that because there is a, an extensive accreditation process for to become a little league leader. So I started that and became a leader shortly after she turned one. Hmm. And so I've been doing that for a while. So that then just turned into more work with it at the hospital and then the yeah. lactation consultant yeah. and everything kind of continued to grow. Yeah. Exactly. So I nursed Peyton past three. Um, during that time, shortly after, I think it was the following year, I became a CLC, so a certified okay. lactation counselor. Gotcha. Um, so I did that and along with Little HA League and then I started in labor and delivery and I was helping moms and, and I was like you know what why not let's just go for it <laughs> well that's um so like I said that's why I'm so excited to have her join us is because we talk about uh, breastfeeding and how important that relationship is mm -hmm. and how valuable it is for both mom 
uh, and newborn. Um, but I've never breastfed. I don't, <laughs> I, I've lived it on the other side with Laura uh, nursing for quite some time with Zeke and, and, and working with patients and stuff like that. But you don't want to hear from me about, about nursing, at least the whole time. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, we've got so many things that I think are valuable for you guys to cover, both joining us live as well as people who will be watching this recording. Um, anything from latch to knowing milk production or tongue ties, lip ties, what sort of support or relationship should the rest of the family or your pediatrician have, endless things. Uh, but like we've said, most important stuff is whatever is important to you. So feel free to mention um, whatever your situation is. I know we've, we had a mom um, in care right now that wanted to learn specifically from you because she's expecting twins. Oh, so we, we'll have to touch okay. on, we'll have to touch on twins a little yeah, bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know Great. a little bit about that. Yeah. <laughs> so a million things <laughs> we're going to go through. We'll start with working through um, what we feel like is valuable, sure. which she knows more than um, anyone having worked with so many moms with those challenges. But I'll kind of be off to the side here monitoring any um, comments or, or feedbacks from you guys as well. So looking forward to chiming in. But let's get started with right off the get-go, why, why are we even talking about breastfeeding? Why does nursing matter? Why is this something worth pursuing multiple certifications and experience? Why do moms need support in this? Well, we want everybody to breastfeed in an ideal world because breastfeeding saves lives. I mean, if we look at third world countries, you know, it would save a certain number of lives if everybody breastfed. Um, and that's huge, you know. But it's the most natural food that you can give your baby. Your, your body makes it. It's free. It's at the ready at all times. Um, it's extremely convenient. Well, it's extremely convenient. Not having to worry about yes. packing food or formula and stuff like that. And bottles. Oh my gosh, the first day I went back to work with them and then I had a sink full of bottles. How could anybody <laughs> do this every day? Yeah. Um, but the issue, you know, why I went through so much certification is because moms have trouble. You know, it's yeah. not just, it's not easy for everyone. And yeah. a lot of people think that it's so natural and you should just put the baby there and they're going to latch on and they're going to feed and everything's going to be beautiful. Well, sometimes it doesn't work like that. And that's why, you know, we need more support in the breastfeeding world as far as IBCLCs or the late league leaders. Um, different people that you know moms can reach out to if they're struggling yeah. um, no, absolutely it's nothing or there's nothing that even comes close to comparing to the nutrition value of definitely um, you know if nursing mom directly to the breast is here you know maybe pumping and some other stuff or donor breast milk is, is right up in that range uh -huh. anything else is a huge gap there right, right? Um, that, I mean, we've got whiteboard conversations that we kind of have with each um, with families each week in the office. Right now, it's about nursing and how breast milk is made to order, right? Yeah. It, it, your body exactly. adapts to what the newborn's needs are. Say your little one's fighting off something, mm -hmm. has a little bit of a need for some extra immune system boost, your breast milk will change and adapt to that. And that's something that nothing else even comes close to comparing to. Or even your toddler. Yes. I mean, he's been refusing. Last week, he refused to eat for a couple of days, and I mean, he just nursed all day, and it was fine. Yeah, it was totally fine. He made up for it. Our bodies are are pretty intelligent, mm -hmm. um, and they know what to do. Right. <laughs> they can adapt and change, and um, it's amazing. Yeah, it truly is amazing. So, such an important thing. Um, which is why we want to support moms as best as we can in that relationship. So let's start from the beginning of where that relationship really gets its foundation, which we could certainly talk about pregnancy and birth stress, and, and we probably will. But let's talk about the very start of life, which you are usually pretty intimately involved in, which is that yes. golden hour. I know that's something you're really passionate about. What does the golden hour mean? Um, how does, what do moms need to know about that? And before I even let you answer that, let us know if there's obviously we got lots of background chatter and noise and playing if you can't hear us okay <laughs> let us know and we'll like move closer or something but the noise isn't probably gonna go away that's fine but let, let me know if you guys can't hear us um, or if, if we're Oliver, no no it's all right <laughs> oh you were all done but I need that topper 
We'll have to clean we'll some stuff out of the cup. It's fine. So golden hour. What is that? The golden Why hour. Is it matter? Oh, it's so important. So the golden hour. I know at, here at Thrive Chiropractic, um, you guys kind of speak to more of the home birthing moms or you know low intervention, which I I love lower inter intervention, and I really strive to support those type of moms. But obviously, I work in a hospital, so you know, we do have intervention, but the golden hour is something that we try to protect with every delivery. Yeah. So it is the and baby. That's including C-section. Oh, C-section included. Yeah. So the baby comes out um, for a vaginal delivery. It's dried off on mom's belly and then placed immediately skin to skin. Um, and that baby stays skin to skin at least an hour after delivery or until the first feeding. So sometimes that means two hours. Um, sometimes it's longer than that. It all depends. Um, if the mom wants to keep the baby there for until she goes upstairs to postpartum, that's okay. Um, it helps regulate heart rate, temperature, breathing, blood sugar. Um, we can do everything we need to on that chest. So if we need to do vitals, if we need to take a blood sugar, if we need to do vitamin K or erythromycin, which are standard newborn medications, we can do all of that right there. And that helps take the pain away as well, that skin-to-skin -skin contact. So a lot of babies don't even cry when we give them that vitamin K shot in the thigh. So the golden hour is so important for bonding, for breastfeeding, just to protect just as that mom becomes a mom, you know, she, she transitions from a woman to a mom and the dad is there and it's such a beautiful transition. And I always try to tell my patients and moms that I talk to prenatally, take that time for you. Take that time for you three. If you have visitors or family members that are beating down the door and want to come see the baby, tell them that you, you will call them when you get to postpartum and you are ready for visitors. Or next week. Or, or next week. Yeah. Um, bring, have them bring you a meal when you get home. Um, a lot of times, and this is, I think, the hardest part, and I've kicked families out for this because, you know, if you're a first-time mom, which we see a lot of times in the hospital medical field, you are being induced because first time moms technically go overdue, which is totally normal. Um, a due date is just an estimation and that's perfectly fine. But a lot of times their whole family comes with them in the middle of the night and they're there all day long. And the mom feels pressure because she's like on clock for the rest of the family. And then as soon as that baby pops out, she's still in stirrups and the family wants to come in. It's like, oh my goodness, please go away. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to give moms some space. Like we said, that, so that moms, relationship's so yeah, important, it but is, it it's really new is. and it's uncertain and you right, need, right. it's vulnerable. It really is. So moms, advocate for yourselves. You know, I want that skin to skin hour protected. You know, I want it just to be the three of us. We made this baby, and we're going to bond with this baby for the first hour or two or however long you want. Yeah, and that's and, – we're saying hour as bare minimum. Yes. Um, honestly, we would encourage maybe the family's not even at the hospital. They're waiting. Um, maybe they get a call when baby's born or a couple hours later, and then a day or two later they can join. And Don't tell them you went into labor. And we – so – and this, this is – important for moms listening but also if you're the family like don't let don't make the mom that you're um, trying to support and in that process force you out be the one to initiate that right um it was really nice for our first birth i don't know if any of our um families listening but we were eight hours away in illinois so we had a nice <laughs> solid buffer zone where we gave like a text of hey i think labor might be happening maybe mid-afternoon and then a couple hours after he was born, probably 1 or 2 a.m., we're like, hey, baby's here. Talk to you tomorrow. And it was great. Um, not that they would have been interested, but it didn't give them an option. Um, so ideally, you probably can't go eight hours away from anyone you know to give birth. Um, but consider yourself fortunate if you do. 
And if you don't, try to put that sort of buffer zone in practice because that's about you. It's not about um, grandma. It's not about aunts or uncles or sisters. Right. As much as, and, and we know you want the best for them. You just want to love on them and support them. And the best way you can do that is give them some space there. Mm -hmm. um, just jump in some comments here. Brittany to have baby number three in... Um, yeah, so, and that's exactly right. She's kind of gone through this transition of it was awkward, uncomfortable at first after right. that. She's like, at this point, I'm confident in just saying it. Good for you, Brittany. You stick up for that. Love it. And that's what we love hearing. <laughs> love it. Um, we want more moms to get to that point. Yes. Um, maybe number one. It, yes. Not wanted to take on three. But well, and even awesome job talk about it, you know, a couple weeks ahead of time. You know, hey, we're going to take, have you heard about this new skin to skin thing that we're doing? Because it's actually a policy at West Penn now. So, you know, we do have moms skin to skin for at least an hour. Um, so let them know that this is what we're doing at the hospital. It's going to give um, you the best chance for success starting off life. So let's say mom's got that first hour skin to skin, bonding with baby. And they're giving baby um, time to do that breast call to kind of work it out on their own. But... It's not, you're the lactation consultant there and you just, you know the latch isn't quite right. How would you know that? What would be, what would be some of the things that you would be realizing or that mom might realize? Um, okay, so, so what are some of those initial signs of, hey, latch isn't quite right that you might wanna, that you might wanna let them know about? We can hold it. <laughs> we might be nursing live on the webinar. Thank you, okay. Over here. <laughs> I'm sure that it's a surprise for, for everyone. <laughs> We're going to do a breastfeeding webinar with yeah. nursing mom of twins. Come on. So one of the first signs of a bad latch is obviously pain. Um, if the mom feels pain, something is definitely not right. Um, it could be the angle of the mouth. It could be, you know, something going on inside the mouth. Mama. And that's pain, not tenderness. So there is a, a distinction that we have to, there's a couple questions that we kind of ask to kind of see what's going on. An evaluation by a lactation consultant is very important in the first couple days to make sure everything is going appropriately and that the latch looks okay, um, that baby's doing fine. But we really don't worry so much in the first 24 hours, obviously for having pain, Yes, we want to fix it. But the first 24 hours is practice for mom and baby. It's kind of the mommy baby dance that you're going to be learning. And <laughs> Oliver's nodding. Yes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, great mom. Yeah. And, and, and touch on, as you probably will hear, whether or not you need to be producing a milk needs to be coming in at that point yet. So, no. Um, actually, I brought my fun little lanyard. Okay. So, this is the size of a baby's stomach at day one. Very small. Do you see that? Like it's the size of a marble. marble. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. So, your body has colostrum. We expect your milk to be in by day three to five. Um, so, that little marble is all baby needs all day long. So this practicing and attempting to nurse, just working on position and latch for the first 24 hours is really important for mom and baby. Just kind of working on, you know, just the positioning. And this is practicing for the first 24 hours. After the first 24 hours, baby wakes up and says, I am hungry and I'm ready to eat. So then they start to cluster feed. <laughs> yes, which is what? what? What can mom expect for cluster feeding? So cluster feeding, baby just wants to nurse. Maybe baby's at the breast for uh, four hours and then maybe sleeps for a couple hours. Or I remember with my twins, if the twin mom is listening, um, I think I nursed for the first three months. And that's okay. <laughs> They um, <laughs> did they plan that out perfectly of like alternating back? Yeah, and, and I kind of wanted to. I wanted them to follow their own bodies. They were yeah. two separate people, even though they were twins. They were born at the same time, but they were two separate people, and I wanted them to follow. Yeah, they. Yeah, you might. Um, a lot of times providers will give a schedule or say nurse every so often. Right. Um, and there's some guidelines that we want to. Paying attention to or aware of, but we 
your babies don't go off of the schedule. You know, they don't, they, they do. don't read the textbook. They don't know how that right. works. We need to, um, breastfeed on demand is, is the, the term we like to use is right. if baby needs something, then we give it to baby. Cause, um, the one thing that we always encourage moms is, and this was really beneficial when our, our midwife, who was also a lactation consultant, the first birth told us that, that breastfeeding is maybe half for the food value and half for just comfort, emotional, yeah. mental comfort. Um, it's the snuggles. It's the fourth trimester. Absolutely. Baby and needs to And nobody talks about it enough. Them. Yeah. Baby was inside. It heard your heartbeat. It felt your, your swaying, your moving, and, you know, just nursing on demand as much as baby wants to, whether it is for food or comfort. And baby wearing is going to help that. Yeah, which kind of comes back and encapsulates that whole give some space from family. Right. Um, if if family's not going to be okay and supportive of, hey, if there's a nursing baby there, there's probably going to be breast out. Yes. That's kind of yes. should be an understood um, thing right. for them. If that's not okay or fine, um, then maybe they need to have a bigger buffer zone right. um, as you're just developing that relationship. And moms, if you don't feel comfortable with Uncle Jim in the room while you're trying to learn how to nurse your baby, because sometimes when you're learning how to nurse, for the first time, you need two hands and you need to be topless. And if you're not okay with some certain family members in the room, say, hey, I need to nurse my baby. So if you want to step out, that's fine. Yeah. I think Laura has shirt on maybe once in the first week. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when um, I, I checked the right after birth. Um, but we were doing my internship and there's amazing pediatric chiropractors in our practice there. Oh, okay. And one of those doctors has stopped by the house. And, like, yeah, maybe we'll put, like, a gown on for, like, five minutes when right. he's here. Um, but, yeah, it's a lot of I just... I wore a lot of robes. Yeah, you want to yeah. wanna give baby the chance to just be open and explore and get into right. positions that they mm -hmm. need to. Um, so, and like Laura mentioned, that three- to five-day buffer is so important because yes. moms start to feel pressure right away. Right. Uh, maybe baby's being born. Maybe they're doing pre-post ways. And, mm -hmm. and there's, there's so much stress and fear that's built into that when we need to remember that there is that big time frame and big window where we don't need to be panicking right away. Correct. Um, so say we're in the tail end of that um, or even during that within that first week or two, how do you know if they're getting enough? When do we need to potentially be concerned or, or something along those lines? Right. So diaper output is what we watch for. So within the first day, for the first four days it goes by how old they are so the first day we want one p second day we want two p's third day we want three p's four p's you know how that's really complex system. yeah really complex so when your milk comes in then we want six to eight wet diapers a day mm -hmm. um if they're not making six to eight wet diapers a day and that's in a full 24 hour period yeah not like a year day of right 8 a.m to 10 p.m. yep and sometimes with these little babies it's not enough to turn that fancy blue line on the diapers blue so i recommend to moms that i round on in the hospital if you're ever concerned about your baby's diaper output if you lay a little strip of a paper towel inside the inside of the diaper and then you open it up and it's damp, then you can tell that the baby has peed. Because sometimes it's just a little, I mean, think about it. They're just so small and they're still only taking just a little bit. So if you are concerned, that's a way to check it. Yeah, no, really, really good advice there is because it's not, you know, maybe you um, bottle fed or pumped or, or used formula for your first and you're used to seeing that, that line, the bottle right. is full and then the bottle is empty and you feel comfortable with that. Uh -huh. um, it's, you don't have that sort of gauge. You know, maybe you can feel more fullness in the breast and then more um, emptying as you get later on or there's more quantity there. Right. Um, but that is something that a lot of moms are uncertain about. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's scary for them, especially if you've never nursed before. You know, you our breasts don't have gauges on them. So it's hard. Women don't trust their bodies enough to think, you know, my body can make enough milk for this baby or these babies, you know? And if you just nurse on demand, your baby is going to tell your body how much milk it's going to need to make. So your baby's putting your, it's he or she's order in. And that's why the first four to six weeks 
Oh, you want me to rub your hair? Okay. <laughs> On the men nursing and hair. The first four to six weeks is so important to be nursing on demand because that's when your supply is established. Your body is going to know how much milk you're going to make for the whole duration of your nursing relationship in that first four to six weeks. So no introduction, no introduction of bottles, pacifiers, anything like that in the first four to six weeks. Yeah, so avoiding pumping and just on breast. You can pump breast. for comfort. Okay. Don't Meaning pump. like if mom feels too full. Yeah, yeah. So if mom feels a little engorged, especially in the mornings, um, you make the most milk overnight because the prolactin levels are higher at night. So a lot of moms will feel pretty full in the morning and they might want to pump for comfort. Yeah. Um, that's okay. Or if you want to just pump one side while you're nursing the other, that's going to help you get the most milk because you have a, re a relationship with your baby. You love your baby. You don't love that cold, hard plastic pump. So if you're letting down for your baby because you yeah. love them, then you're going to let down on the other side too for that pump. Yeah, there's a lot. It's way more than a mechanical, oh, <laughs> right. there's a stimulation and so I'm going to produce. Yeah, um, yeah. That's not how anything in the body works. Right. So speaking of getting enough production regulation, mm -hmm. any tips or thoughts on what moms can do if they feel like they're not producing enough? Um, which one thing that we would jump straight to, which maybe that's... Oh, you want a nurse too? We got a full house. What do you say? So while you guys are talking, one thing that we always jump straight to is make sure you're hydrated enough because so many moms uh, are thinking about the fact that they're producing more liquid that is being taken out of them. Just like if you were working out and expelling liquids, you're going to need to drink more. Nursing, okay. breastfeeding yeah. is going yeah. to be using liquids out of your body. So stay hydrated. You really need to drink a lot for that. The other thing, how perfect is this for breastfeeding? <laughs> Did you have a 100% chance of this happening? I mean, I figured it yeah. would probably happen. Um, so staying hydrated and make sure you eat enough. We know that post baby, um, you want to bounce back in every way possible when you want the pre-baby body back and it will come. Nursing will really help that because you're burning so much energy. But make sure you're eating enough to feed those nice. little humans. Are really, it takes more nice. nursing, um, or it takes more extra calories nursing than it does even in pregnancy. Pregnancy, everyone talks about eating for two and, and all this extra food, um, but you need that when you're nursing even more so. Hi. Um, and not just enough calories, but extra um, protein and especially mm -hmm. extra good fats. Breast milk is a uh, high portion of that is fats. So avocados and coconut oils and good high quality butter. Um, I love trail mix. Trail mix, nuts. Yeah, yes. that's awesome. I, if you're I nursing, went, yeah. it maybe if there's just one, I don't know about two, but you get one hand nursing, <laughs> right. one hand trail mix. Yeah. Um, so make sure perfect, that you're eating easy. enough. That's kind of our first guess if moms may be wondering about the trouble with production. Are you drinking enough? Are you eating enough? Are you getting enough good fats? Anything else you would add to that? Just. I'm grabbing coffee. Okay. <laughs> um, up your nursing. Um, add in an extra nursing session if you can. You know, so breastfeeding is supply and demand. So if you think that your supply is down, you have to nurse more. That's the most. <laughs> She's listening. What? <laughs> Laura. Oh, Laura. Yeah, Laura <laughs> is chiming in, walking through Target listening to this. <laughs> so you have to, I would always go to nurse more um that's the only proven way to make more milk a lot of moms will go to like supplements like fenugreek or um like mother's milk tea i don't like to go to those those are we call galactagogues um sometimes they can do the opposite in moms and actually reduce milk supply so i always go to just nurse more. Yeah, that solves a lot of problems. Yeah. Just more, <laughs> more of the good stuff. A um, couple random topics here. Nipple shields, are they beneficial? When are they beneficial? Any thoughts on that topic? Nipple shields, I cringe when I hear nipple shields. Um, I think there is a time for nipple shields, um, but I feel like, especially in the hospital setting, they are handed out too often by nurses. Um, if you have flat or inverted nipples, yes, 
you might need a nipple shield until your body gets used to breastfeeding. But that's not as many moms as it's yeah, happened. not as many moms Mama. really need a nipple shield. Um, a lot of times, moms will give be given a nipple Mama. shield for breast pain, Mama. where they breast should pain. really be given breast shells. Um, I don't. Have you ever heard of the breast shells? I don't think so. They're pretty Talk cool. To me about that. Um, What's a breast shell? Anybody know? Uh, so a breast shell looks like. I wish I would have brought one. It's a little kind of cup shape, but on the inside, it has a ring. So it will go around the nipple. So you'll put your cream on and then put it on and then cover it up with your nursing tank or bra or whatever you're using. And it'll protect the cream from getting stuck on your tank. And it will protect anything from rubbing against that sore nipple. So if you know, somebody's given a nipple shield for nipple pain, they need a breast shell instead. Gotcha. And so that's going to, that's not during nursing, that's protecting the breast and the nipple Correct. throughout the rest of the day. In between nursing. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, good, right good, now. good not thoughts right on that. Not right now. This is another hot topic that, um, or maybe, maybe it's more so for our world and, and things and conversations we're hearing. I'm guessing you'd have some thoughts on it as well. And that's ties, tongue ties, lip tongue ties. Tongue ties, lip ties, um, yeah. How so. frequently are you seeing those involved? What can moms do to know if they have an issue with that? Um, yeah. So there's different grades of tongue ties. Um, I'm definitely more of a watch and wait type of lactation consultant. Um, he actually is tongue tied and we never intervened because we didn't need to. Oliver hurt me worse when they were babies because his Mama. mouth was smaller and I nursed through eight weeks of pain anyway. So I was like, well, they're getting enough, so it's fine. Um, so if your baby does have a tongue or lip tie and breastfeeding is going fine for you, it's not painful, your baby is gaining appropriately, I would definitely err on the side of weight watch and see what happens. So you're more concerned with the functionality than the actual anatomy? Correct. Um, if it's excruciating and your baby's not transferring milk appropriately and not gaining weight, then of course you probably need intervention. And I would maybe add in if, um, if there may be some <laughs> side of symptoms such as reflux or if they're maybe getting some air with that or that, that relationship is maybe that doesn't hurt you, but you're noticing they're spitting up a lot, mm -hmm. um, that might be a red flag that the tie is affecting the right. nursing relationship as mm -hmm. well. Sure. Um, any thoughts other than get your pediatrician or lactation consultant to check it out as far as how a mom can know if that's a part of um, what's going on with the baby? Definitely. So you can um, see a lactation consultant, of course, and we can look at it for you. Um, and we can give you resources in the area of who you can go to. And your pediatrician will also look at it for you. Um, you want this side. Oh. Yeah, and that, that's something that we, um, we check and we talk about with moms and their newborns. And if there's anything that's on the cusp of borderline, our recommendation is always get with the lactation consultant because mm -hmm. they're the ones that are gonna be more um, thoroughly able to assess, is there a tie or not present? Right. Um, but and that could be tongue or lips, or there's even buccal ties and a lot mm -hmm. of things involved. Um, cheek, back of the cheeks. So one, get it assessed by them because they're going to know is there something present, and then more importantly, is it affecting that right. latch? Um, so that's where we are going to check it to a certain extent. But we would absolutely recommend go to the professionals mm -hmm. um, because you guys are the ones that know really the ins and outs of not just is it there or not, but is it affecting that relationship? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, Let's see, what else we got some topics here? And let, and let us know if there's anything else that you guys were hoping to get out of this. I see, Brittany, what is the recommendation for babies who have small mouths? My first one did, so we went with the shields. But with this third one coming in December, I really want another option to try. So, Brittany, so how you went with a shield. So small mouth. Small mouth. If baby number three has a small mouth. Any thoughts on that? Um, my little Oliver back there had a small mouth and it was painful at first until he grew a little bit. 
Um, I would just make sure wherever you're delivering that you request to see an IVCLC before you go home. Um, get that latch checked. Um, you know, you never know how this baby's going to come out and how this baby's going to latch. Every baby's different. So it could come out, even though it might be small, it could latch perfectly and you could have no pain. Um, so just, you know, if it is small, then I would definitely take the action to get it assessed by yeah. an IVCLC. And if you would need a shield again, I know some people are very pro shield for small mouths. I particularly don't like to use them for small mouths because then moms get to de get dependent on them. And that's what, yeah, I don't know if you noticed, but she mentioned a comment earlier of first one had a shield, but weaning off of it was yeah. terrible. So it's had some downsides for sure. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen moms come to group and they are frantic because they forgot their shield at home. And they're like, I don't know what to do. I can't feed my baby. And that's... Uh, it's just so terrible. So definitely try and try and try without the shield. But if you need it, you need it. Um, but I would definitely try because your baby's going to grow. Yeah. Hi, Owen. <laughs> so having, having that IBCLC, not just the nurse or the, the whoever's in the room there right. checking your latch um, at the hospital, that, but like we talked about earlier, that's kind of practice. Let's get the hang of this, especially if you're a first time mom. Right. Is there a certain period of time, one, two weeks, uh, a month or two after that, you would recommend, hey, let's check, check in with the lactation consultant again, see what that latch is like now that we're used to it? Or is that more of a as needed basis if there's problems? So if you're still having pain after a week or two, I would definitely check in again. Um, because there could be some other issues underlying that we might need to see. Um, Brittany, are you delivering local? Yeah. And while she, and there, there'll probably be a, a delay back and forth. Okay. Um, so as, hopefully, Brittany, if you're still tuning in, let us know where you're delivering. Um, but I think she might be in Butler area, oh, if I'm okay. remembering properly. Okay. Um, I had another thought on that topic. Don't remember, but I'm sure we'll come back. To it. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see here. Someone on Instagram asking Michelle, this is Hi. Emily. She is lactation consultant, La Leche League leader, labor delivery nurse, um, and nursing mom of twins. So that's who we're chatting with, breastfeeding expert. She was wondering who who our conversation was with. So if you're joining <laughs> us late, that's who Emily is. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to mention as as we're getting some feedback from Brittany there is. Um, the oh, role. I love the midwives. I'm yes. so sad they left West Penn. Jefferson with midwives. Okay. I know a couple of the LCs there. Um, we also have a nursing moms group every Wednesday at West Penn. So there's an IBCLC or two there. So feel free to come in if you need support. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's always the answer is, is mm -hmm. get some help especially it could be the peer-to-peer -peer, the late j league leader because those moms are the leaders are maybe they're not at ibclc sometimes they are sometimes they are they've got yeah. immense personal experience and they're probably going to know when you do need to take that further step to a lactation yeah, consultant yeah. um one of the things that we always talk about at least like maybe you're wondering why the heck is thrive chiropractic talking about nursing <laughs> um that's something we see all the time with our newborns and i maybe I'll get your feedback from here because I don't know if we've really talked about this in person before, but something that, that we see all the time with a labor and delivery process that did have some more interventions, maybe mm -hmm. mom wasn't supported enough to have that, to feel empowered to have a, sure. uh, let her body do the work. Um, if there's any pulling, twisting, forceps, vacuum extraction, that's a significant amount of strain oh, to yeah. the top of that baby's neck. I mean, we all, even with our 20 month olds, we wouldn't grab them by the head and neck, let alone a newborn. Oh my gosh. Um, and yet we do that frequently when someone's coming out of the birth canal. Um, so as you can guess, that's gonna create some significant shifts and stress in the top part of our neck. And that is what we see so, so frequently also contributing to a newborn struggling to latch. Um, so anytime that you're, you're having some issues with the nursing relationship, can you also notice that maybe baby isn't able to rotate their head equally side to side. Um, maybe that torticollis word is thrown around where we kind of always have the same tilt 
and they're always looking up in the other direction. Um, maybe you know if they're a little older, they're starting to develop a flat spot on one head. All those things go hand in hand with stuff we see all the time. Usually that newborn is struggling to nurse. Usually they're a little bit refluxy, a little bit more tense and fussy and, and colicky in general. Um, and so that's where, that's why we as pediatric chiropractors care about this so much because what we're able to do then is through those gentle specific adjustments, remove that tension and, and shift and misalignment up top, allow their body to get back into ease. Um, because both the structure and the anatomy and physiology is fine, um, <laughs> of that top part of your neck, that affects that, the reflex. You don't have to teach your newborn how to suck and how to nurse. They have that built in. Mm -hmm. But if there's shifts and if there's stress in their nervous system, that's going to be interfered with. They might not have that normal suckling motion or their mouth and jaw might not be able to move properly um, because of that. So that's one of the things I would encourage as well is, is if you're noticing um, a issue with nursing, um, absolutely. We're going to tell you if you're coming here to go to your IBCLC as well. Um, but I would recommend getting uh, your local pediatric chiropractor. Hopefully that's us if you're listening, if you're around here. Um, we love cute babies, so please bring them in. Um, it gives us something to put on Instagram. Um, so please reach out to your local pediatric chiropractor and find out if that shift in stress and misalignment up top is affecting that nursing relationship as well. Because that goes hand in hand with later challenges as well. If those newborns don't get those problems addressed, they end up with ear infections down the road and then they're the ones that end up on what we call the perfect storm pathway, which is a whole another hour plus long lecture. That we've, we've done that before. So I won't, I won't um, go on that rant right now, but I definitely want to make sure we mention that. Thank you. Question for you, Emily. Yeah. Um, let me see if we else. So before we move on, Brittany said, second amazing breastfeeding nurse for two hours right after she was born. Oh, that's it's wonderful. Amazing. So some thoughts from Sarah. Let me, um, I'm going to just read this out loud so you guys just aren't having a staring screen. Wish I would have had all this information when I had the boys. Nicholas never latched, pumped for two weeks. It was rough. Postpartum depression got the best of me and gave up. I'm sorry, Sarah. Um, that's rough. That's, that's what we hate hearing. Mm -hmm. With Ethan, no intentions of even trying because terrified of going through it all again. Mm -hmm. Ended up pumping again while he was in NICU and then um, because he felt pressured in it. I feel like more support and more help at home after delivery would have made it an option for us. Wanted to breastfeed my kids, but it didn't work out. Had a tongue tie release on Ethan, um, so on, so on, so on. And honestly, that right there, Sarah, is the reason that we are talking right now and the reason that we talk so much. Like I just heard this at our delivery event when we're talking about birth, is that I hate hearing the regret. I yes. hate hearing the, the hurt later on of right. I wish I would have or I should have, would have, could have. Um, because there's just so much guilt and pressure and stress and, mm -hmm. and there's, there's nothing you can do. You can't go back. You can't change that. Right. Um, and that really sucks. And, and like Kim said, like that, sorry to hear that because that just, it just sucks. That's, there's no other way to put it. And that's where I, we want to get this information out and we appreciate all you tuning in and joining us because more moms need that support. You all right, buddy? More moms need that support and that encouragement Right. Because your bodies are amazing. They're intelligent. They are well uh, designed and they're capable of accomplishing that with the right team, with the right birth team, post-birth team. Um, so yeah, sorry to hear that. And, right. and thank you for tuning in because we want more moms to have that experience. And Sarah, breastfeeding isn't all, all or nothing. Um, I want to put that out there too because yeah. so many moms, you know, maybe they try to breastfeed and they have to mm -hmm. supplement a little bit. Or maybe they try to breastfeed and when they go back to work, they dry up a little bit. Um, breastfeeding is an all or nothing. Sometimes we have to add a little bit more of formula or donor milk or whatever it be. Um, sometimes that happens and you still are a nursing mom. You pumped for two weeks yeah. and for that baby in the NICU, that's so important. Absolutely. Our NICU babies to get breast milk is so, so important. So good for you for trying. I mean, don't put yourself down. Yeah. You tried. Absolutely. Reiterate that a hundred thousand percent. Yes. Um, that's uh, any amount of nursing or breast milk is life changing because it yes. is what is best. It is the uh, best thing you can do for your, your child. Mm -hmm. um, Brittany, when do you recommend first adjustment after birth? Uh, that depends on how birth went. For example, our situation, um, Zeke's birth was like there's nothing honestly we'd really change about that that's not the normal uh, but with him 
where like he came out in Laura's arms. He went to the breast um, when she got out of the tub there, and he went pretty much straight to latch. Um, when babies are able to and, and seeking out and nursing right away, hi buddy. <laughs> He's climbing the window over there. When babies are are able to accomplish that, that's kind of like checks off the majority of your newborn exam. You know, things are looking good. So with him, we didn't jump to that. And it was maybe like an hour after he was born. Um, I know it waited so long. Uh, and the, the midwife was doing newborn exam and I checked him out as well. So as soon as an hour after born, there's others that maybe that birth process was extremely challenging and stressful and, and honestly my dream world which maybe we'll have to create this we'll have to create this utopia someday where there's a pediatric chiropractor in every NICU and in every delivery room awesome. um and well, seeing that maybe there was some significant birth trauma and, and um, there had to be some torsion and bullying mm -hmm. there they can yeah. be right on hand so that's our dream world um what a lot of our parents do because not a lot of chiropractors have possible privileges or, or, or in the the um the delivery rooms there mm -hmm. is maybe on the way home from the hospital or maybe in the First couple of days afterwards, um, so yeah, there there's no too early. Um, I, I guess to answer Get that down. question, <laughs> what do you see out there? There's dog. Zeke always loves. Look, we're right here by the sidewalk. You see dog washing, walking oh. by, just so distracted. So maybe there's you see some neighbors. Anyway, so let me know if that answers some your question. question. Um, I think that was Sarah's, and then the oh, my oh, six oh. month old first two teeth. Oh. So six month old's got some teeth and teeth and starting to bite. And how does my nutrition affect the quality of milk? We talked about that a little bit ago, Carrie, but we can touch on newborn is biting, what to do about that once they get teeth. Obviously you have some experience with that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then also um, the nutrition component. We, we'll have to maybe jump back to the video, but basically eat enough, eat a high quality um, diet in general, enough fats especially is gonna really cover your basis for, for that carry. Uh, but yeah, thoughts on teeth? Teeth, so if they're biting, they're not actively nursing. Um, you can say, no, that hurts, stop the nursing, put them down. And then when they decide that they wanna nurse again, use, use a phrase, we usually say be gentle. Um, and then if they do it again, we say no, that hurts, no biting, put them down. Um, and as far as nutrition, yes, we want you to eat a well-balanced, healthy diet. But if you eat Snicker bars all day, it's not going to be healthy for you, but you're still going to make milk, and it's going to be fine for your baby. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to so, hurt you more than it'll hurt them. Right. It'll be harder to bounce back, I'm sure, but yeah. you'll still make milk. Um, so here's a really common topic that we didn't discuss at all, but so much misinformation on that. Drinking alcohol while breastfeeding. Pump, yes. pump and dump is not a thing. No, please don't pump and dump. It doesn't make any oh. sense. So please explain um, before I start ranting how <laughs> how a breastfeeding mom should she choose to have some sort of alcoholic beverage and incorporate that in her yes. breastfeeding relationship. Enjoy your drinks. Have a couple drinks. You deserve it. Um, <laughs> so if you feel too intoxicated to the general rule of thumb is if you feel too intoxicated to drive a car, then you shouldn't nurse your baby. Um, and generally speaking, that just goes as far as safety and carrying and being around your baby, not as far as alcohol content in your milk. Um, the alcohol content that travels into your milk is so small. It's like 0.09%. It's very, very small. So the intoxication as far as driving is just for safety of holding and being around your baby. So please have a drink, relax. Yeah. And the, the whole pump and dump thing doesn't make any sense because no, you're still pump and dump. Your, your breast milk, um, it's not like you produce it, it goes into a tank and it stays there until you use right. it. If the blood alcohol um, level, if the alcohol level in your blood goes up, it will go up in your breast milk. Mm -hmm. As the alcohol level comes down in your blood, um, it comes down in your breast milk. Right. And so whether or not you express or expel any of that milk, the, the level of alcohol still comes down with it. So be um, conscious and aware of, of any time you're alcohol, and obviously we don't want to be passing that along to babies, but it's not maybe as Hi. you've heard um, the, the old wives' tales of, of how that process works. You need to come in through here? Let's jump over. No. 
He's not. He's, if we're you not feel, friends right now. <laughs> if you feel, if you still feel a little too iffy about that, I've told moms, if you feel like you have to pump, then pump your milk and you can mix it. You can star it and then mix it with a day that you weren't drinking. Yeah. So dilute it basically. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Never want to never want to waste breast milk. No, don't waste yeah. breast milk. Save it, um, save it forever. <laughs> six. Speaking of six months, is typically a timeline of, of when you would want to get rid of frozen breast milk. Do you feel like that's they really need so, to get rid of it after that? No, six months in like a stand up attached freezer, like a fridge freezer combination. Um, <gasps> one year in a deep freezer, so like a chest freezer. It stays really, really frozen. Yep. Yeah. Good, good tidbit. Um, so we've been talking for 50 minutes now, and this has been amazing, and I'm, I'm so glad that we've had people um, getting value out of that. Thank you guys again for joining us. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, to make sure that we touched on was when they're seeking help, when should they maybe go to the LaLeche League leader, the LaLeche group? When do they need to know if they should go to the IPCLC? Um, yeah, is there, right would you differentiate between that? Would you say there's never a bad time? There's never a bad time. I think La Leche League is more targeted towards, so La Leche League is mother to let mother. Me, yeah, let me interrupt you. Explain yeah. what La Leche is. La Leche League is mother to mother support. Crazy. It is getting crazy. <laughs> we, I think this is the cutoff limit of the webinar. It's not how long people are listening, but how much our toddlers will tolerate. <laughs> but you guys are doing awesome. Yeah. La Leche League is mother to mother support, guidance, and encouragement. Um, all of our leaders go through an accreditation process, and we're there to help through the birth, through weaning, and beyond the normal breastfeeding relationship. Um, and mainly, it's it's a great source of community. Um, moms have found other moms that, you know, friendships are formed in the Leche League, and they last for so long. I've Because you're around like-minded, yes. similar stage of life individuals. So just hearing from other moms, and it's like, oh my gosh, my baby's doing the same thing. So it's just, it's nice to hear from other moms that, you know, it's, you know, you're going through the same thing. Um, La Leche League, not all La Leche League moms are, um, usually La Leche League is not healthcare professionals or IBCLCs. Yeah. So they are just all volunteer, peer-to-peer -peer support. Yeah. So anything out of the norm, um, any issues, you should see an IBCLC, yeah. someone more specially trained. Yeah, because okay. honestly, a lot of the value of just the LLH League peer-to-peer -peer support is the um, kind of the, it's not just a, I guess, mechanical, there's a problem issue. It's There's a emotional time investment, right. mental drain to that, that right. being around the like-minded tribe can really fill your tank in that sense. Yes, definitely. Um, that even if there's no problems, breastfeeding still like it's, it's not a small commitment. <laughs> no. like, uh, maybe it, it is more convenient, maybe than some of the other things we talked about in the get go. But right. it's still a, a big investment into definitely. your child's future. So have that support. Um, reach out to that group and thank your La Leche League leader because, like she said, that's it's a volunteer position. Her uh, La Leche League salary is is not covering a whole lot of uh, anything there because it's <laughs> it's just time that they give right. to support and pour into other moms. Um, uh, all on a volunteer basis there. So thank them if you are a part of that sort of local group. Um, do you want to cover anything on, on pumping before we, we sign off of here as far as working moms, pumping relationship, any thoughts along um, that line? Working moms, my best advice for working moms is get a hands-free bra and a pump car adapter. Um, I love to pump in the car on my way to and from work, especially when my boys were little. Um, it would just give me two extra pumping sessions that maybe I couldn't get in at work. And just that stimulation, again, back to supply and demand, that stimulation would just help my supply. Yeah. And if we, that's something we hear a lot, that supply and demand, moms will say like, oh, they're nursing more on one side than the other. Um, or they, my one side produces more than the other side. Totally and normal. It is totally, totally fine. And it's probably because they are more actively stimulating that side. So mm -hmm. then it's going to be more actively um, producing. One, I would say totally normal with the caveat of, um, depending on how significant that discrepancy is, because one thing from our perspective 
that we frequently see is um, a newborn that is struggling to latch on one side. It's because their maybe the way their body's positioned or their mm -hmm. head is rotated on that side because of that stress or misalignment up top, and they're not able to just nurse as well. And right. so then they're not stimulating as much and then mom's not producing as much um, because then after a period of care, moms will often say like, oh, they're nursing much better on both sides now. Right. So we would say normal with the, with the caveat of um, if there is a big discrepancy with some of those other things we talked about earlier, like not rotating head as well, maybe reflexy, colicky, that is, it could be a sign that there is some shift and some stress up top that maybe um, a pediatric chiropractor could be a big part of getting that calmed down and helped out. Fair enough. Fair enough. Man, this is a blast. Um, I feel like we eventually need to stop. I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, and I know we should, but I, I feel like we could keep going on this um, breastfeeding supporting rant for hours yeah. and hours and hours, but um, we'll, we'll end it here. Please, if you're watching as a replay later on, still throw your comments up. Um, we'll moderate this. Um, we'll answer the best we can. We'll tag Emily and have her um, sure. volunteer more of her time to yeah. you guys and, and give that up. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Sure, for sharing with definitely. Um, thank you guys for joining. And I just hope that it was as valuable for you as it was fun for us. Yes. And you guys did awesome. And moms, um, <laughs> set yourself up for success. Yes, have the right support system. Yeah, have the right support system. Reach out when you need help. Yeah. When you get home, set yourself up with a nursing station, nursing pillow, snacks, water, Netflix remote, camp out. There you go. All right, guys. <laughs> have a awesome rest of the Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining in.